on the podcast today, we're going to speak about why Easterners and Westerners think differently, specifically why Asians and Westerners speak differently, especially, you know, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Far East Asia. And so there's a lot of common belief in the world, and this is not new, that there's this one universal way of thinking, right? So we all supposedly think the same. Which it, is what predom- predominantly, I think, Western way of thinking. Western way yeah. of thinking, yes. And this is promoted by a lot of, you know, especially influential people. So like, uh, especially like someone like uh, Francis Fukuyama, who's a political scientist, well known. And he actually believes that there's one universal way of thinking and it's Western and more specifically, it's American. <laughs> so, so obviously a lot of the world would probably you know, choke on their breakfast if they heard that sort of information. But maybe a lot of Americans actually believe that, you know, that the world is thinks just like Americans. But it's not true. It's not true. There's not one universal way of thinking. That's what we're going to unpack today. And it is really interesting, especially when we look into regards to spirituality and how um, Eastern spirituality, especially how it evolved in the West and how we came to New Age interpretations of Eastern spirituality and why that is. It's a very crucial subject to talk about and address these things actually before you get into uh, spiritual practice. Exactly. Yeah, because uh, Eastern spiritualities come from East, come from the East, mm. so that we need to understand the way we, way the Easterners um, think. Yeah. Which is actually very fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're Eastern or I'm Westerner. <laughs> Westerner in air quotes yeah. <laughs> with a, probably an Eastern mind. But um, yeah, what you say is exactly right. Like this. See, that's one of the problems. See, like people are trying to understand Eastern philosophy or Eastern spirituality with no context or no background of what the culture is in the East or, you know, and the mind of the people in the East. Is it different? We're just, our assumptions in the West is often that. Everyone just thinks the same as Westerners, you know, like we're all individualistic and we're all, you know, self-interested and, and out for ourselves in a certain, from a certain perspective. And <clears throat> this, this is not true, especially when we come to, you know, cognitive research and a, a lot of um, testing in the laboratory on Eastern and Western thinking. And, you know, a, a good example of this is in one of our favorite books is The Geography of Thought by Richard Nisbet. Uh, who's a famous psychologist, and Richard's books, Richard's book is very popular, but it's it's relatively unknown, right? Like his his work, and I mean it's only a two hundred and something page book, but it just it gives you the straight dope on this is like just meat. This is the meat. This mm. is like mm. this is the data. This is the research that we've conducted, and there are fundamental differences between the psychology of the East and the West. Now, to, to, to you know, build a foundation for that, we have to look back into how both areas of the world evolved, hence why his book's called The Geography of Thought. And you know, I have a, a video, The Geography of Mind, about this from four years ago. And so when, when, we, ev- see, when we evolved, like we were influenced by the environment that, that we evolved in. So... If we look at the, the core of the East, which would be China, India, is kind of the, the crux of you know, Eastern psychology, the, the crux of the evolution of the East. And then if we look at the West, it, it's Greece, right? The evolution of Western civilization comes through Greece. And so when we look at the environmental factors that in both areas, in both locations. So let's first, for example, let's look at Greece. The main uh, labor and way we attain food and, and, you know, and our, and our mainly daily activities were hunting, herding, and fishing. Now, hunting, herding, and fishing, we can do as a group, but it's often done um, individually. And when we look at specifically the evolution of Greece, uh, the evolution of the West, the population in that time was very spread out and they were in very small communities. In some sense, there was not, not even some communities. There was in, individuals just living off their own fishing and, you know, their own hunting and, and they, they, you know, had 
goats or whatever, you know, so forth and so on. So that's the the core of how cognitively the West developed. It developed in an individualistic manner. And then we, if we look over at the East, then we, if we look at China and India, the main uh, re- the main source of food was rice. rice. And rice, when we are cultivating it, is done in a, in a large group setting, especially when you have to feed large large amounts of people. And and this also comes down to a population thing within the East as well, because especially in China and India, there's always been a dense population. You know, even when there wasn't so many people in the world, there still was in com- in comparison to the the, to- the totality of the world in both places. It had always been a large population. And, you know, that's accentuated, obviously, now because they both have over a billion people. But th- there was this uh, de- dependency on the group and the collective. And so what happens then? Well, they evolved collectively to think collectively, not to think so, so about themselves so much, about their own ego, and which also influenced certain uh, structures in society like with the the hindu caste system and everything like that so it wasn't oriented towards the uh the individual so to speak it was oriented towards what was best for the community what was best for uh you know the just the survival of everyone within that community so everyone then applied themselves to certain philosophies and certain uh social structures and so and you know this has a big effect when we look on how Eastern spirituality evolved because Eastern spirituality uh, is an outgrowth of that collectivist thinking. That co- it, that, see, this is where the worldviews are different, right? Because the worldview of the East is a, a holistic model of the world, right? It's a holistic model. It's a, it's a model of everything is connected. We are all part of the same thing, so forth. So and you go deeper and deeper down the line and you talk about Tao and Brahman and, and all of these things. But then when we look at greece then you got you know you become more individual oriented everything is about yourself to a certain degree you know what i mean you are self-interested you're about what's good for my family what's good for me um and 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 i I want to make a point here there's nothing wrong with either or thing it's just the way that we evolved and as you know this has a lot to do with actually the natural cognition of our mind so and to explain it like a lot uh, we have two functions of the mind which is the hot and cold cognition or, or uh, system one and system two and the cold cognition is the the in the prefrontal cortex in the frontal lobe of the brain here and that is kind of what had evolved um, for humans which separates us actually from monkeys and you know all other animals but it evolved for us to navigate through you know when we were evolving like you know there's a line over there we have to strategize and you know physically we uh we're inept you know compared to a you know (laughs) you know i mean an elephant or a lion or or some or, or you know a fierce animal like that so you know we developed this slowly over time you know thousands and thousands thousands of years and then this is where the analytical part of the mind is in the cold cognition. So this is where the intellect resides. This is what gives us the ability to uh, make critical decisions, to strategize and so forth and so on. So yes, it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not the main power base of the show. The main, the main core of our mind is the hot cognition, all of this back here. So that's what allows us to speak effortlessly in conversations, allows us me to do this with my hands, open and close my hands without thinking about it. It's that fast, spontaneous and automatic function of the mind, which is what we use most of the day. It's the predominant cognition we use most of the day. Now, so when we look at that, when we look at the cold cognition in the prefrontal cortex, that's the analytical part of the mind. Uh, That's what makes these decisions and so forth and so on. Um, and is to benefit the individual. You know, I mean, I mean, it, obviously, it, it can be used to benefit the society and co- collective as well. But the way we evolved, you know, so then when we have the hot cognition, it's the holistic part of the mind. So that's the intuitive part of our mind. That's that part of our mind where 
we have an intuition that everything is connected. We are part of something much greater than this. Um, it's that part of our mind that makes you play the violin without having to think about it. It's that wisdom of the body as well. It's that unconscious regions of the mind. And the, why I mentioned that is because the way that the East evolved, it was more related to the hot cognition. So there was, it, it was more about what, you know, it was, all, it was more about the holistic perspective of that we belong to something much greater. Whereas in the West, it was more, we, we resided more in the cold cognition because we had to make decisions and this and that on an individual level, uh, which, which contributed to the, the evolution of the West. Yeah, uh, and over time, like the languages have developed in different way too, which mm. is very interesting. Like, mm. um, like for example, Chinese. Mm. Well, we both don't really know much about Chinese, but it's very non-linear language. Mm. There is no like a past tense, future tense, yeah. like that. And even like Korean, like which is my first language. Mm. Um, in Korean, normally uh, there is no in the conversation mm. there is no subject in a sentence yeah. so it's more like a, a verb based mm. like doing something or mm. yeah something like that so it's uh that subject is kind of uh, eliminated in the in the statement but we all know what we what you're trying to say mm. right mm. so which is uh, quite interesting whereas um like well, Latin is the root of all the European language, mm. which is uh, included uh, English. Yes. Is well always would come with subject first, right? Without subject, doesn't make any sense grammatically, right? Yeah, yeah, and um, like German's the same, and very uh, subject oriented, which is very in the individualistic uh, way of thinking. Like mm. I think. Um, or I go somewhere, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. uh, there has to be a specific subject at the very beginning of the uh, sentence to make sense of the language. The so whole structural aspect is kind of completely different. Mm. Hence, we know that how uh, Asians find it very difficult to learn um, Western languages yes. and vice versa, vice right? Versa, yes. Which is very interesting. Yeah. Well, you saw my lame attempts at learning Korean. <laughs> well, it lasted more than a month. And, well, yeah. <laughs> but it is interesting, especially with language, like, because even when you and I were two young lovebirds, and, like, you speak very good English, but the, uh, the habit of the way you speak in Korean is overlaid into English. So... One good example of that is when I did a lecture back in 2011, if you remember, we went back to a friend's place and they put on a fire and, and so forth and so on. I don't remember the individual's name specifically, but there was an Australian and there was a, an, an Asian guy and they were speaking and uh, the I think he was Chinese. He was speaking about, talking about whatever subject it was, but like the way he was talking is, a, is in a roundabout way. And then the Australian guy's like, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know why this guy was so anxious, but he was like, come on, man, get to the point. And do you see, that's, that's, that's the differences in the language, right? So like in English or in Western languages, you, you're trying to get to the point as quick as possible. Whereas Chinese is a good example. You are speaking about the subject, so to speak, but you're not speaking like for or for or as that subject you're speaking about the events around and not so much like i do blah 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 so much more like a, trying to uh, explain the landscape, the landscape of the subject yes for the easterners yes i mean i still have that habit too like yeah. i try to say something but i feel like it's kind of instinctual i don't mm. need I don't intend to do that way, but it's mm. just, it just comes out that way that I need to explain other things first mm. to get to the point. Yeah, yeah often that um, causes you know, a bit of a um, problem sometimes. But Well, the problem comes because I think with other English-speaking people, it's different because they're used to people just getting to the point in the conversation as quick as possible. So they may become uh, maybe impatient with you because they may be like, 
why is she talking about all of this other stuff? I know it's related to a certain degree, but why doesn't she just explain it this way as we do in English? Now, that's a, just a lack of understanding on the English-speaking person's part because they don't know enough about what we're talking about now. And actually, not many people do at all. And this comes back to, again, how we both evolved, the Easterners and Westerners, because when we look at the individual perspective and the cold cognition, the, the key attribute of that element of the mind and Western society is categories and objects. So everything is categorized and it's based on, a, like an, on an objective perspective and, and objects and you know things are separate and so forth and so on. Whereas in the East... It's, it's about relationships and context. So it's a relational reality, and we explain the context. This is like um, the core of these. So, so, what, so what especially Chinese people do when they speak is they, they're, they're explaining context when they're, when they're speaking. You know, as you said, there's, there's no, uh, as within Chinese, there's no like um, I, me, this and that in, 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 in a sentence. So, like you said, it's very verb-oriented as opposed to noun. And, and no surprise, when we think of God in, in the East, we don't think of God as a noun as you would in the West. You think of it as a, as a verb, like as a, it's, a, it's a something, you know, it's a happening. It's a, um, yeah, what does it do? Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, so when you, when you talk about Brahman or Tao, you're not talking about a noun. You know, God is, in a sense, in the East, God is a verb. So, but it's interesting that that's also, that comes, that's a, that's a language thing too. It's a linguistic thing. So that's one of the, one of the important things to understand, especially if, for those who are listening to this podcast, is that Easterners and Westerners, this is the crux of it. When, when you have um, Westerner, they're always thinking in categories and objects. Everything has to be categorized. Everything has to be compartmentalized. Everything has to be in subjects and, and so forth and so on. It's kind of ironic, right? But then when we look at the East, it's all relational and it's all about context. And there's no surprises that when we look at a lot of the spiritual and philosophical tenets in the East, they didn't have compartmentalized views of their philosophies. So, for example, if you were learning uh, yoga, you were also at the same time learning Jyotish astrology and you're learning um, Ayurved, you're learning, but not as separate categories. Th this separation has come from when we've started analyzing Eastern philosophy from a Western perspective. So then we've started to make categories for, for uh, this, these spiritual paths. So then yoga is like something different from Ayurved, something different from... Uh, Vedanta, you know what I mean? Like, so you have all of this separation when it was all, in a sense, one sort of seamless way of thinking. But once Westerners got hold of it, we compartmentalized it, made it into subjects and, and categorized it. Yeah, this, this I think, is uh, very strongly connected with something I was watching yesterday, which you recommended me to watch the mm -hmm. talk, uh, the conversation between Jidu Krishnamurti and David Baum mm. back in uh, 83, something like yeah, that. 83, yeah. So they were talking about like this limitation that we have. Mm. Um, our knowledge is limit, limited, mm. means our thoughts are limited. Mm. And when we make a statement uh, such as, I am an individual, right? Mm. You are limiting yourself as an individual in a sense. Yes. So, uh, with what you were saying, we uh, Westerners like to make everything into like categories and um, put into uh, certain subjects and look at it, things in a very subjective manner. Mm. Is a str there is strong limitation goes into it, which uh, people might uh, not uh, aware of it, mm. right? Mm. So, like you just made an example of yoga, studying of yoga. Once we separate uh, within the yoga, like astrology, Ayurveda, mm. and whatnot, then we kind of uh, unknowingly limit the knowledge into very categorical way, which mm. 
prevent to understand the understand the connection between these different field of study mm. under the um, big uh, how can I say big subject of yoga mm. for example yes. once we categorize it the limitation comes with it mm. without uh, you want to try or you don't want to try just the way that's how it works yes. and that limits our yeah understanding of whole things yes whereas the knowledge itself is all come from one root and which is based on uh, eastern way of thinking the holistic way of thinking because uh, they come it, it comes from one philosophy mm. so that why not understanding what the philosophy is about fully mm. then goes into categories then we can we can maybe categorize but but then we that may help uh, you to understand these each different field much more thoroughly, right? Because mm. you will uh, kind of eliminate that limitation. Exactly. Yeah. But I don't even think we would need to categorize it. There right. may, may be no need because, mm. but it depends on, again, like what cognitive state you're you're mm. associating with. You know, if you're associating mainly with the cold cognition, then there's going to be a natural tendency to want to categorize and that to make sense to you in some sense but f for yourself growing as an easterner you may not need that certain categorization or you may because you grew up with korean education which is is very westernized so there is a and that's why there is a friction in places like korea and places like that because it's like a different state of cognition being superimposed onto a holistic state of cognition and so there may be a tendency for that, but you make a good point because instantly when you start to comp comp compartmentalize a subject or or even people, then you are limiting them. As soon as you say, I am an individual, you are admitting you are limited. You are limited, you know what I mean? Yeah, like just, a, just one personal example. I mean, my experience, uh, like I was in a conversation with someone, um, the young people, and um, we we're talking about oh, what kind of music they like and I don't know what they do in the spare time and whatnot. And as you know, I'm quite a quiet person within the people. Mm. And like, I was talking about like, oh, I like to watch UFC fight. I'm like, huh? <laughs> they were really like, you like UFC fight? You're into MMA? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, but what's so, so wrong about it? Maybe they... Uh, judge me under some sort of category mm -hmm. and my answer was kind of completely like beyond their expectation so they were real their reaction was very, very like shocked yeah and i found it kind of very uh, interesting and a bit funny too actually but that's a, you highlight a good point because because being westerners they have a category of of where you sit and how you should behave and what you should like because for them, that makes sense to them. If they put you in that category, mm -hmm. oh, she's a spiritual person. She must every day be standing on her head, uh, you know, reading, mm -hmm. the, reading the scriptures and this and that, um, and never having any fun. Then this is a big mistake. See, this is, a, a, this is part of the, that sort of hypnosis of the cold cognition because you're, you're looking at life and you're putting it into categories as if nature equates to categories, and it doesn't. From a holistic perspective, we all understand that from the hot cognition, you know. And certain spiritual paths understand that, like Taoism, for example. Taoism understand that morality, for example, is a, is a human concept. It's based on individuals' perspective of what is good and bad, but within nature, that morality doesn't exist. There's only nature and we are a part of nature and, you know, we can go further and deeper into that. But from that perspective, there's no categories and objects. And Taoism coming from China is a perfect example of relationships and context, of understanding the world as this spontaneous happening and vibrant organic reality that we're all a part of. And it's beyond our intellectual understanding and our and our ability to categorize it you know what i mean oh uh, guyang is she's spiritual she should be doing this she should be doing that 
she likes UFC. Like, what's what's that all about? Yeah, what's wrong with her? What's wrong with her? Like, she must have some sort of, you know, schizophrenic split. <laughs> but the schizophrenic split is in the individual who is projecting that scene because they're not seeing reality as it truly is. They're not looking at reality as nature. They're looking at reality from an intellectual perspective and they're using their intellect to cut up reality into um, categories and it's so that it makes sense to them, you see. So that categorizing tendency of the West is actually in some sense incorrect because you're not perceiving reality as it truly is. And that's in some sense why especially Eastern spiritual and philosophical paths are in some sense more natural and also make more sense than a lot of Western spiritual paths because they're based more on a holistic reality. And this is interesting, especially when we look at Western religions and so forth and so on, it can be, they can be very individual oriented. So, you know, it's all about the individual, right? It's not about, I mean, it is about the community too, but it's more so about the individual. You trying to reach heaven um, and there's no greater sense of like karma, for example. Karma is something, you know, on a, on a, in a, from an Eastern perspective where it's more about a collective reality where you have to take care of your own karma and it's about, you know, coming into harmony with the society and so forth and so on. And I know some people may say, oh, what about sin and that in Christianity? But it's completely different, you know what I mean? Because, again, that's uh, sin is coming from a sense of judgment where karma is just the responsibility of the individual to the collective. So um, you, you reap what you sow, you know what I mean? Like if you are acting in a certain manner, you will the equal and opposite... Um, reaction will, uh, or action effect will happen to you, you know. So it's it's interesting how, how both the when we look at the evolution of the West and the East, how it both contributed to different spiritual ideas and paths. So where you have the idea that in the West, where uh, hum- humans are separate from God not connected so there's a separation and there's also then a separation between human and nature you know what i mean so it goes down the line and i know that this may have began with someone you know like a the king of kings like darius the first you know what i mean who, who started this king of kings tradition where you know god is this entity that lords it over people and judges them and condemns them and then this infiltrated you know a lot of christianity and islam and uh Judaism, you know, all of these sorts of religions. But then when we look at the East, then there's no separation between the individual and Brahman or Tao. There's only one non-dual unified reality that you're a part of. And problems only occur when you identify with yourself as an individual, which is, it's interesting, right? So the East is about the dissolution of the individual, where the West is about the expression and the the prom- promotion of the individual. Now, I'm not saying either or is right or wrong, but the Western perspective, this is where you can end up in trouble when you fully believe you, you're this person here and you're expressing yourself and you think that what you are doing is right in life and so forth and so on from your own agendas and your own self-interest and your own... Uh, isolated beliefs which don't in a sense you know blend in with everybody else and this is the thing in the east where it's always important that the the collective harmony is first and foremost considered and even from like let's say from a yogic or from a a perspective of a sadhu or someone like that you're trying to attain moksha not from an uh like a individual egoic perspective but in getting rid of the ego and the individual you merge with with the greater totality mm. and in that and that also relates to the caste system yeah. you know one of the i know that the caste system gets beat up and 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 rightly so there are elements within the caste system that are that did develop in, in a very unnatural way but one of the 
the foundational understandings was that if you, in a sense, apply yourself to the system and, 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 work, and, and work through your own ego and serve the greater community, then this is what leads to uh, you following you know, the path to, to, to moksha in some sense because you're just, you're not you know, acting out of your own personal self-interest you're not promoting your agendas on anyone else and you're, you're not wielding your beliefs and influencing other people in the way that you want to or the way that you think. I think uh, yeah, Eastern philosophy is um, built on this um, very fundamental idea that um, like, it seemed like the people back in those days had a good understanding of like uh, how other people feel and think mm. as well as how they feel mm. so which is the same basically when they feel um sad they might other people might feel sad as well yes. and when other people feel happy about something you feel happy well that's why uh we feel so good when you do some you know some good work volunteer work or charity work and whatnot and that's why these things are actually important the communion uh, co communal uh, way of um, thinking and behaving is actually fulfilling mm. Mm. so that kind of uh, understanding that what i feel is what other people people may feel this kind of the same thing and mm. this kind of understanding is a kind of a mm, widespread like a common sense kind of thing mm. for mm. everyone so that um, what's good for me is what's good for others what's bad for me what's bad for others as well exactly. so that uh, if you come from that kind of place it's kind of absurd to think uh, you're an individual I I do things for myself, and this is good for me. This kind of a, this kind of way of thinking is not even there, really, no. because that kind of that's a conceptual thing, and that sort of concept is doesn't even exist for the a lot of a lot of Easterners. Now, obviously, many things have changed, but fundamentally, it's always been there and I still believe it's there. That's mm. why when a big crisis happens, like this is a difficult time at mm. the moment, mm. uh, they show great um, collective uh, work together mm. and helping each other out. And because they know what's good for them is what's good, good for others Not as well. Exactly. So it's more so like a caring aspect is there, mm. whereas maybe Westerners might be a bit different you know? like yeah, of course. What, this is what I want to do I'll, I have um, I'm entitled to do whatever I want mm. I mean that's not wrong but if that sort of behavior and way of thinking might harm other people mm. then well we have to think deeply about it yes I think. well that's why there are a, a bunch of articles out there now from studies that are saying that you know look if we look from a cultural perspective, how everyone's dealt with this virus, then the evidence is there that a lot of Westerners in Western countries haven't dealt with it as good as they should have. Like if we look at Australia here, we've got far more infection rates than Thailand, which has far more people. What's the difference? Like you said, in Thailand, it's more about let's do this together. Let's get this done. Let's get this done. But what about my... See, and the problem in the West is, what about my individual rights, my civil liberties? And yes, we can all sympathise with that, but this is a totally different situation. This is a time that we have to unite and get something, you know, eradicate something that's foreign to the environment. You know what I mean? And so if we look at Thailand, they just, in a unified manner, got the job done, you know? And, and I'm only using two countries as an example here, but... It's across the board. Like in the studies and the research on this, it's, it's, it's pretty self-evident, right, when we look at the infection rates around the world, that the West haven't dealt with it right. And it's because of this tendency that, you know, it's our right to go outside and it's our right to do this and that. And yes, we all agree with that. No one disagrees with that. Easterners agree with it too. But it's a different time. 
And it's a time where you have to actually show that you do care about your neighbors. You do care about this and that. And it has really put the West in a sense, in some sense, in a bad light because it showed that maybe some people don't care about their neighbors. So maybe they, they are just out for themselves, unfortunately. You know, because it, that's, surely it's there, right? Yeah, definitely. What's happening right now is kind of a clear-cut evidence yeah, of, of um, how uh, each nation deal with it. But it also shows the culturally... Mm. Um, the cultural differences between the nations as well. And well, it highlights what we're talking about today. Yes. It, it highlights exactly what we're talking about. It highlights the collectivist perspective as opposed to the individualist perspective. And yes, there are problems with the collectivist perspective and also with the individualist perspective. But in a situation that you're in now, we have to think more collectively. We have to give up certain things that were creature comforts six months ago. It's a different ball game now. It's how you adapt. And this is why I love places like India and, and Southeast Asia and stuff like that because the people are so hardened and tough that they can deal with any situation. They adapt so well to each and every situation. And now I'm also mindful that India has a high infection rate, but that's, I think, due to the, you know, the size of the population, obviously. Obviously, Pakistan as well. Um, but if we look at you know, Sri Lanka, Nepal, not so bad, you know. Um, so, but you look at Southeast Asia and China and Korea and Japan pretty much got a handle on it, you know. But again, it came with a unified effort. You know, it's more of a collectivist view. And anyone who wants to know more about that, just Google up the psychological impact or the differences between culture and, and the coronavirus and how... The differences of, um, you know, how Easterners and Westerners have dealt with this. And, you know, for you and I, it may be self evident, but for people who are, you know, maybe triggered by what we're saying, just go and look at the evidence and look at the scientific research. But again, it comes down to what we're talking about today. And it's interesting when you were saying that what was good f for the community and, like, um, you know, if someone's sad, then everyone is sad. I remember like when we were living in India, um, it was especially mind blowing to me 12 years ago, but not so much anymore. But when like someone would die in the community, right? And then, you know, like a normal funeral, you know, even in Korea these days, right? A normal funeral, only, you know, you get a handful of family and this mm -hmm. and that. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you have a funeral in India, the whole town comes out. Mm -hmm. Especially like if you go to Varanasi or something like that, like good luck going to get your afternoon chai because the, the back streets and that are just full of people like, you know, ce cele celebrating the life of that individual. We're not mourning in India, which is, again is a different, different uh, cognitive view. There's no black. We don't wear black. We wear all colors in India and we... You're very colorful and very, in a sense, festive. Festive, yeah. And you see the colorful flowers around the, the body and yeah. like... It's a very, um, yeah, festive, and they congratulate, it might sound a bit strange, but they congratulate the life of that yeah. person and um, actually death of the person. As we know, like you mentioned about karma before, a uh, very different thing in the East is that they, uh, especially in Eastern spirituality, they believe in reincarnation, which mm. is, again, very holistic way of thinking. Yes. That... This life is not just one journey. Mm. There might be the next one until you fully evaporate your persona mm. and become uh, one with God, unify yeah. with the God. So they congratulate the, the death of the person to go into the next journey of life. Sure. This um, way of thinking. When I was, uh, when I heard this first time, like, oh, that's very strange, but. Mm -mm -mm. Now uh, it kind of gives you such uh, relief in life. It makes you feel much at ease because in in Christianity they think this life life is very linear, linear, mm. and if you do a lot of sinful behavior, you will get condemned and you will go to 
hell mm, mm. and there's no such thing as next life next or life or not, yeah. things like that you go so, somewhere <laughs> yes to, which makes us feel very like i don't know um guilty or mm, mm, feel mm. very um claustrophobic yeah claustrophobic yeah. that yeah. like oh it make, makes you feel like anxious i mm. gotta live good life and if you did something um not appropriate mm. makes you feel very guilty mm. Whereas in Eastern perspective, it's kind of, it can be forgiven. Because mm. yeah. in the philosophy of karma, yeah, right, sure. can always be forgiven. And um, there is no such thing as sinful because there is no clear cut judgment. Mm, 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 yeah. So that's something, kind of, kind of very refreshing way of thinking. To yeah. Me. Mm. yeah. Well, karma is like accounting, right? You weighing up the checks and balances of, of lives, you know. And it, and it relates to what we're talking about because you, you raise a good point because when we look at the Western perspective of judgment and sin and this and that, it's, it's predicated on the idea that there's one life, this life, this is the de facto life you have. There's just this life. See how individual oriented that is? There's just, Gaiyang, this is your only life. And if you stuff it up, you, you're in, you, you get judged to eternal damnation. You know what I mean? But when we look at the East, again, it comes down to that collectivist idea that life does die and moves on to other life, just as, you know, like vegetation continues to die and be reborn and so forth and so on. And likewise, with, you know, when we look at it from a naturalistic perspective, humans and specifically consciousness just moves on to the next life and becomes whatever it will be. You know, according to that energy, it has been in that life. And so it's a very natural view of how things, you know, evolve and, or, you know, or move on to the next life. It's very holistic. So this is not your de facto life. This is probably you know, one of one of thousands yeah. or, or, you know, yeah. according to the Hindus, it could be one of millions because if we're looking at yuga cycles and so forth and so on, it just... The, the, it's it's a you live in eternity you don't live in some sort of um stationary finite reality you're already in eternity you know so that's one of the beautiful things about uh, the east and, and again like going back to the funeral and as you were saying it's a celebration of the life scene and it's a celebration that they've moved on to whatever it is hopefully moksha or maybe they're going to be reincarnated you don't know it's all due to that however that individual lived their life but it's it's a celebration of life it's, it is kind of interesting when you think about it like obviously hindus get sad too you know when people die because we do miss our loved ones but it is interesting that we do that like easterners will celebrate the life and it's interesting that we mourn it in the west you know like we, we really mourn like we go into like you know really um Dark, dark, dark. Um, dark feeling in the funeral. And yeah. Like. Well, I had to mourn both of my parents' death when I was really young, right? So, and that's a, because I'm a Westerner, that's the way that, just the way that I know, you know what I mean? I never thought to celebrate and look at the good things that happened and the experiences I had with them in my life. I do that now, but I'm a lot older than when they died. So... And it's interesting because when you know talking about funerals and this and that, like when my dad died, he had been working at that. He he used to work at a meatworks, as you know, and he worked there for like thirty seven years, and he was like part of the furniture there, <laughs> you know? antique and an antique, you know. So and all of the young guys that they really respected my old man, you know what I mean. And then, um, but him being such a quiet guy and this and that, it was it was it was interesting the effect it had because when he died. There wasn't just like the family there at the funeral. The whole, the meat work shut down. Wow. So everyone was free to go to the thing. It was really crazy. And I was thinking, wow, Jesus Christ. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it was really interesting. Mum was the same too because she worked at a school and, and um, all the teachers. And it was really sad because the kids would come and they were mm. crying. And that was even more sad to be there. You know what I mean? But it's interesting that how an individual's life, when they are, my mum and dad were very selfless people when you're connected more to a greater reality, you actually have more of an effect on that reality than what you think. Yeah. You may not have an you may not have like a 
it may not look like you're significantly impacting the environment, but you are. Mm. You know what I mean? You're sad. <laughs> <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's a bit emotional. But you know what I mean? Like, so you do have a, a, an effect on that reality. You know what I mean? So you don't have to be like someone who is, you know, an outstanding individual um, and that you're going to be praised at death and this and that. So most of the time... It's not that way. You know, we've often heard of the stories of, you know, really rich billionaires and this and that that have had only a few people attend their funeral. Like they never really did touch a lot of people in the ground level, you know. And I'm not saying that that's a... a well, it does reflect a little bit the individualistic perspective because a lot of... Well, not a, well, I can't really say a lot of, but there must be some billionaires and, and millionaires who are out for themselves and they're very individualistic and don't care much about anyone else but their pockets right mm. so that's why you see you know maybe they don't get as much appreciation when they pass on as someone like my dad who was just chilling you know cleaning the the meatworks you know what i mean like yeah i mean uh first time that when I visited India was when I was like 20, 21 mm. years old. Mm. And um, me, and fam- my, me and my friend arrived in Delhi. Mm. And the second destination, the final destination was Calcutta. Mm. Uh, but we made a stop at uh, in Varanasi. Mm. And a lot of people might be familiar with the place mm. because of the river. Mm-hmm. Ganga River, and uh, one another reason why the place is very famous is because of the Burning Ghat, mm-hmm. where um, a lot of um, death people get um, burned mm-hmm. and the ashes get um, spread in the river. Mm. So that's kind of the ultimate ideal death they want to all have mm. as a Hindu. Mm. So uh, again, I didn't know anything about. Hinduism, Eastern spirituality, nothing, nothing, Mm -hmm. right? But so, and I don't think I knew about the burning god much. Mm -hmm. I knew that exists, it was there, but so um, it's it's just there, as Mm -hmm. you know, you can just walk around up and down the bank of the river and Mm -hmm. it's just there. Again, burning god never stops 24 hours functioning. And all people who work there are volunteer workers. They don't get paid anything. They might get paid shelter and food, but they all work there for nothing. And they basically have this um, uh, immense um, amount of the joy Mm. of doing it from giving people ideal funeral Mm. for those people. So... You can literally see like a meter apart if you want to yeah, go there close, yeah. close that want, yeah. someone gets burned. Yeah. Like, and I was pretty close. And um, I, again, I don't know if it was male or female, and just mm-hmm. getting burned. You can s- kind of see like face, and mm-hmm. like, and this person working around the area, you know, as body burns, it kind of a uh, Breaks apart, mm. and uh, <laughs> this guy kind of pulled uh, like a leg or something because mm-hmm. it was like falling, falling, falling off. Yeah. off. Yeah. So he just kind of chucked, chucked on, on top, top yeah, and yeah. like you can see the joint. I'm like, oh, that's a bit <laughs> surreal. <laughs> <Yeah>. But <clears throat> when I when I saw that, I felt like, oh, actually, when you die, mm. it, it, nothing. It, it doesn't. Mm nothing means anything really like and i kind of had a bit of a realization that oh, it's actually the kind of life that you live in is everything mm-hmm. that's much much more important than what you achieve and what you want to show off to people prove the point to people how mm-hmm. um i don't know worthy worthy you are mm-hmm. and how wealthy you are mm-hmm. That doesn't mean anything. Mm. In that uh, person who was getting burnt, if in the future it will be me. Mm-hmm. So, like, why would I have to chase some illusionary things to uh, 
please other people mm. like mm. it's it's nothing really nothing. in the end yeah it goes to show that the especially the body is just the vehicle of consciousness right when you go to the burning car you know, well that's the biggest realization for anyone really yeah. because it's so so surreal yeah and you're you're celebrating that expression of consciousness, right? You're not you're not, cel- you're not celebrating the body. The body was just the vehicle for that consciousness, and it's it's you know because you and I have we had lived in Varanasi for a, two two months. Mm. It's um it is interesting because when you go to the burning gut, anyone can go there. It's not like a private funeral or anything like that. It's pe- it's packed all the time, but. The interesting thing about the place is that it's a it's a, one of the most meditative places in the world when you think about it. I mean, if you can get outside of the smell and everything like that, because you know, they, you know, when the smoke is wafting around, they, it's you know not the best smell, but but it's it's a highly meditative place because you know, it just it's just an amazing sense of like something greater than ourselves. Again, it's taking you out of the individual experience. And it's a very contemplative place, and it's and it's interesting to experience that with so many people at the burning gut. You know what I mean? So it's kind of about that individual down there, but it's more about that individual's life and how it affected everyone else. And you and I, being strangers, don't even know those people. We're affected too by sitting there and 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 going through that meditative experience. You know what I mean? You are coming face to face in a sense with shiva you know what i mean with that destructive element of the universe and so you know i it's what it's it, it's probably my favorite place in varanasi or, you know outside of just the ganga itself but you know it's such an amazing thing and, and that celebration of life is something that actually will touch anyone you know when we fir- when we first started living there but like like you as well like because we're not accustomed to that you are a little bit like you're put off at the beginning. You're like, oh Jesus Christ, this yeah. is this is confronting. You know what I mean? But then you start to see into it. You start to see. You get beyond your own preconceptions, and you start to see deeper into it and understand it better. And it's actually probably then you start going there every day. Where are you going to meditate? Going down to the burning gut. People think he's he's lost it. Fully lost it, <laughs> but it's it seriously. It's you know it's a highly meditative place. And if we ever had the opportunity to take people to Varanasi on a tour or a meditation retreat, then that would be one of the places we definitely visit. You know, it's interesting because you know, it the way that we see the world, especially as Westerners, we think that that's the way it should be for everyone else. And this is one of the big problems. And we all we all. Are affected by this. We all have this idealistic tendency that oh, our way is the best way, and so forth and so on. And when you go to places like India, your whole manual and your whole textbook gets thrown out the window. Yeah, that, that just gone out. Uh, out doesn't, the door just doesn't blank. equate doesn't yeah. equate to the environment yeah. because it's a different culture, different belief systems, and a more holistic way of looking at the world. You know, this is why. There's certain problems when you go to the east. Well, well individuals feel like there's problems, like because you know you have uh, certain meetings or commitments that you you make with people in the in the east, and then they turn up half an hour late and this and that, and you know everyone's like, you know, as as Westerners, you're like, why are you late, man? Like what you said, but like there's kind of like a general understanding that yeah, it's all good. You'll get, you know. Things happen, we'll get there, and, and so forth and so on. It may not, you know, apply a lot to, you know, big businesses in the West, but that's how things function in, in the East. You know what I mean? Like, so, for example, if you're going to get a bus from Varanasi to Lucknow, and they say they say 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you know it's leaving at 5. So, you just, you just chill, you take your time, take your time, and we'll get there. Yeah, when we were in India, people call it Indian time. Mm. And maybe we were in Thailand, in Thai, Thai time, time. <laughs> Thai time yeah. and just that's just a kind of common knowledge for everybody. Knowledge. Yeah. And it's funny because once you're in and you live in those environments which we have, it doesn't bother you anymore. You know what I mean? Like it's not life's not regimented. You know what I mean? And this is one of the problems in the West. It's so regimented where it has to be like this and have to do it this way. And there's a sense there's control issues in the West which have never been dealt with. We need to control the reality. 
And what you realize in the East, especially when you go to somewhere like India, is you don't control jack. You know what I mean? You control nothing. And so you have to get used to that, mm. that you have no control actually on life. Mm. And you need to, because it's in your face anyway. And these are the great lessons actually of Taoism, Buddhism and Vedanta and yoga and Sankhya is that you don't you control a slither of your life you you we controlled how you made this tea you know we controlled the lights we put on here but it's like it's like so minuscule yeah, it doesn't make big difference <laughs> exactly and when you understand you're part of something much greater then you have this sense of like this you diminish your your addiction to control you know your addiction we're addicted to try and control reality right and so we have to overcome that addiction because reality always has something different for us anyway, you know. Yeah. We think we control, you know, a lot, but we don't control anything. At, well, we don't control most things. Yeah. I wanted to bring up about this uh, uh, subject that how this uh, Western New Age way of approaching eastern mm. um spirituality how um how that basically come about because i never I mean because i'm not a westerner i don't understand it mm. like good. yeah I, I do understand it come from different uh way of thinking and cognitive uh, functions mm -hmm. but i still don't get uh, how people can't grasp in a kind of proper way to look at um, more holistic holistically mm -hmm. yeah because philosophy itself is based on holistic thinking mm -hmm. and um the way people way westerners um take on eastern philosophy seemed very like off the track somewhat mm -hmm. yeah but it, that comes back to the individual orientation right? mm -hmm. So when your your primary cognition is cold cognition, and you are your perspective of reality, your worldview is individualistic and analytical, mm -hmm. then when you are introduced to Eastern spirituality, then you are looking at it as how it will benefit you as an ego, as yourself, as Guy Young. How is this going to benefit myself? Mm -hmm. So this is how, for example meditation becomes culturally appropriated and becomes something like that we just use for business we turn mindfulness into a commodity it becomes all individual oriented when you and i know meditation being we're talking meditation in a general sense here from an eastern perspective is about the dissolution of the i it's about uh, decreasing that individualistic and in egoic tendencies that we have and sure, we can say that may benefit you in business, but that's you know, that's not often the case, right? You have to be strong-headed in business. You have to be, obviously, if you are humble and compassionate in business, that may benefit you down the track. But when we look at people who are highly successful in business and so forth and so on, they are strong-headed and sometimes can be arrogant and pretty much an a-hole. So the, that goes into New Age thought, right? And this began all the way back... Maybe before the 1800s, but if we look at the 1800s, if we look at theosophy, right? If we look at Madame Blavatsky and all of these individuals, mm -hmm. Annie Besant and all of these people who are influential in, in um, kind of the um, first of well, the pioneers of Westerners who, mm -hmm. who, who started to assimilate Eastern thought, this led into a lot of New Age spirituality. So... You know, energy is thought of a different way as it was originally in mm. in Eastern thought. Um, then we get into crazy things like unicorns, and you know, you go you go down the line. Like, and I know that's not just a part of the uh, evolution of New Age thought, but it's all that comes from the West as well. Those sorts of ideas. But then you start to take like the mythology of the East, and you start to over sensationalize it, and in some sense, take it literal, and. And we're not the only first people to talk about this. I mean, Joseph Campbell, Alan Watts, these sorts of philosophers were speaking about this 50 years ago. You know, Watts would talk about 
how people over sensationalize Eastern spirituality, right. where Eastern spirituality, in a sense, is very human. It's very human and humanizing, and about and it's fundamentally about not being at odds with your own humanity. From an individualistic perspective, when you're a Westerner, they take it, they over sensationalize it, and they make it something about themselves that's more grand than be an odd in the <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so instead of being humble and compassionate and forgiving, we make it like, oh, look at me, like. You know, I am an enlightened being um, and so forth and so on. You know, as you know, because of my work, I get a lot of emails and messages from people. I don't know why, but they're trying to validate their understanding by really strange things. Like I had this one individual recently saying, I am the mother of the universe and this and that. And, you know, I just kindly ignore these sorts of messages because that is from a very arrogant place and not from a humanistic from not from a human level see mm -hmm. that again is taking eastern spiritual understandings and applying it to yourself and promoting your ego then boosting your ego i am an enlightened being there is no i in an enlightened being you've already fundamentally got it wrong enlightenment is not i am brahman but brahman without the i yes. The eye is completely dissolved. There is no one to claim they are enlightened when you are enlightened. And this is one of the big problems. We've got Westerners, and then we also have Easterners now too, especially because of this, going around claiming they are enlightened and claiming they're an enlightened teacher. When they fundamentally, if you understand enlightenment, there is no I to claim that. There would be a sense from other people that you are enlightened. But usually the enlightened person is very humble and very, you know, like very human and very caring. You know, they have these very humanistic qualities where New Age have over-sensationalized these human qualities, you know, and turned like chakras into this certain thing, kundalini into this this outrageous thing where you just blast opening, out of your opening head. Opening the oh, heart chakra. And yeah, I know, I know. So this guardian angel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets crazy. My heart chakra is completely open. It's like, no, that's not what it's... No, 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 no. <laughs> when you live from the heart chakra, that means you're very human. You're very compassionate. You're humble. And you don't go around saying you live from the heart chakra. You have a sense of a feeling, that an energy that you live from this place. Yeah, you don't have to go out and telling people and promoting no, what you're experiencing. No, of course not. Of course not. Yeah. And that's, again, an arrogant perspective because Eastern spirituality is about the dissolution of the individual. It's about an understanding that the individual does not exist and never has. It's a part of your brain that you've identified with. It's a function of your brain that you've identified with, which is only necessary and useful in a social setting. So can I get those oranges, please? Here you go, sir. This is it. It's, it, it has a utility. It has a social public function. Public use. It has public use. And that's all it is. The problem is, is when we identify with that thing, we, that, that public utility. Mm -hmm. So, and, that's, and see, this is what New Age thought don't understand. They've identified still with this part of the brain and then they take the philosophical tenets of Eastern spirituality and sensationalize them as to being something, you know, to promote their sense of, you know, higher state of consciousness over other people. It's very individualistic oriented. When, as you know, all of the great sages in the East, because they do dissolve the eye, they have, they tend to, people tend to gravitate around mm. them because there is a sense that I can trust what this man or woman has to say. You know, I can trust this individual because mm -hmm. they don't seem like they have any self-interest or any agenda. Mm -hmm. They don't have anything except for my best interest at heart. You know, and that's you know something that definitely New Age people don't have. They don't have the other person's best interest at heart. They have their own best interest at heart. And they have their own flaky understandings of oneness and, and so forth and so on. Yeah, just uh, as we were talking about it, just came to 
came from my memory that um, remember the documentary called "What the Bleep Do We Know?" Yes. Yeah, that kind of uh, sums up all that new age phenomenon yes. of the West yeah. that uh, they over sensationalized uh, of this uh, Eastern from spirituality mm. and like law of attraction if mm. you keep um, thinking and imagining about something then it'll happen mm-hmm. and that's very uh, incorrect understanding of um, energy exactly yeah. and that uh, motive was to benefit themselves mm. which is very um, uh, self-interested way of thinking yes yeah yeah that whole idea of you create your reality actually is not as true as what people think See, people watch What the Bleep and they don't do enough research about that film. I'd suggest anyone listening, go and read a book by Sean Carroll. He's a proper quantum physicist. He's been on popular podcasts such as Joe Rogan. You can even go and listen to the podcast. And they do speak about this. And Sean pulls it all apart and then actually exposes the people who made What the Bleep and the lack of actual real experts in that film. You know, and so there's the over sensationalized perspective of you create your own reality. Yes, we do create our own reality to a certain degree, but not to the degree that that film was, you know, promoting. Promoting, mm-hmm. and and also like relating that to Eastern mysticism, which was very uncomfortable to watch for myself because it's like that's not actually what that. Easter talking about mm-hmm. like I don't know how some films can get away with that sort of thing mm-hmm. but it happens you know so and even from like uh, Western esotericism because like when we look at um, hermeticism and we look at Gnosticism and we talk about the law of attraction and we look we have to talk about mental alchemy and again mental alchemy is not specifically like you just create your own reality because you think it you know what I mean it's all about um, your intention it's all there's a lot of things that go into it to create your your own reality so to speak you know what i mean they're not saying that you literally create the building blocks of your reality you know what i mean like there's certain elements that you create but it's also it's from a level of your own state of consciousness and so if you if you want to learn more about that just study mental alchemy study hermeticism and you'll understand that um this idea that they use in What the Bleep, for example, mm. is a is a warped version of the actual knowledge. It's just like taking like uh, one of the one of the laws of Toth and one of the seven laws of Toth and and and, and over sensationalizing that law and equating it to like quantum physics, you know, which is not entirely true, you know, mm. and people think about like. So, for example, um, one quote by the Buddha was, um, how does it go? It goes something like, um, you become what you think, or something along those lines. You know, you, But that's not talking about that, that, that the reality is, you know, you, you are, your reality that you experience is the byproduct of your thoughts of how you think about the world and so forth and so on. It's on a much deeper level, right? It's more talking about psychological states. Exactly. Mm. It's not, the Buddha was not talking about that your thoughts become your reality. They become your reality in the sense of how you experience the reality. Mm. Not in the sense that the reality changes according to your thoughts. All right, I'm going to think about dinosaurs. The next minute I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the Jurassic era. No, it doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> If you're a negative person and you're always thinking about, oh, why are they doing this to me and this and that, mm-hmm. don't be surprised if the reality you experience doesn't change because your thinking is not right. You're thinking in the wrong way, mm-hmm. you know. But if you're thinking positively and you're thinking, you know what, I'm just going to let the world be as it is without me, you know, having an agenda or, or an idea of how it should be, mm-hmm. don't be surprised if you live in a pleasant reality. Maybe around people who are living in not a pleasant reality. You know, we all are our own universe to a certain degree, you know. Mm. And so that's one good example because people use that quote of the Buddha and they, they mm. superimpose it onto mm. law of attraction. They superimpose that onto mm. quantum physics. And it's, 
that's not even what he was saying. And that comes from a lack of understanding of what the Buddhist teachings are, you know. So there's no like sort of, as you know, with Buddhism, it's very austere. It's not very, the mystical elements of Buddhism came later on when, you know, through Mahayana and through uh, Vajrayana and and also the mixture of, uh, with Bon and Tibet. So, but if we look at the early Buddhist teachings and we look at Theravada Buddhism, it's very austere and very just about, you know, Vipassana. You meditate, you meditate, you meditate. Very raw. Very raw. Mm. The person doesn't exist. The person doesn't exist. This self you think you are is an illusion. And once you really come to that knowledge or that understanding, then you experience Nirvana. And Nirvana is not some place that you go to. Again, which is a new age thing that, again, is related to Christianity. See, a lot of new age thinking in the West, and this is a lot of things that we don't understand when we talk about this, is that Western psychology is on a subtle level influenced by Christianity, the way we think and everything. We think in terms of judgment. We think in terms of sin. You know, we we think in those terms. Yeah, like you strongly addressed that in your book, Enlightened Now, yes. that monar- monarchical view yes. of the world that uh, originally came from Christianity, yes. that God is an individual mm. who is above you, above yeah, above you, above, above uh, humanity, yes. and looking down and uh, judge you with your behavior and whatnot, yes. that monarchical view and that yeah what you were saying then with what you're saying that it um yeah very uh intimately strongly um interrelated to the western way of thinking yes Mm. it is yeah it's part and parcel like if you look at most westerners they think in that that sense even if they're not christian atheists still think about it this is what fuels our morality in the west it still fuels our morality, even if atheists want to disagree with or not, because they are influenced by this. Again, Abrahamic religion, which is um, Judaism, Muslim, mm-hmm. and Christianity, yes. are all moral-based systems. Yes. Systems, and all they all all three religions have monotheistic. They are all monotheistic religions. Yes, exactly. So yeah, very strong uh, judgmental. Yes. Traditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's based on there's a Lord above you. Yeah and judging you always and that there is a place you go to after life according to how you've lived and if you've lived a good life you've been this moral person who's very pious who is promoting your own agenda and beliefs on other people which is another form of tyranny that's psychological tyranny on other people which obviously those religions don't consider you are causing harm on a psychological level because you're not letting people live their life that they want to live naturally you're promoting your agenda. You're forcing your opinion on them. You should be Christian. You should read the Bible. Blah, blah, blah. We'll go down the line. You, as a as an individual in a society, you repeat the same thing. Yes. That you imposing your will over other people without understanding the, the other people's yes. um, life. So if that their philosophy that there is a Lord above us is true, then that imposing the will would be a sin you see so why is it not why is it considered good because you're promoting christianity because you are in a sense causing harm to another person you're telling them how to live and how to think this is not very moral Mm. you know so it's very self-contradictory but they're not thinking yeah of course it is but they're not Mm. thinking about deeply enough see Mm. they're not thinking about deeply enough this is where the where the eastern philosophies have thought Like, as you know, they go fully, fully right, right, right down to the ground. Mm. That's why in the East it's all about accounting. It's all about checks and balances. The debt that you owe as an individual. and you, As a very personal level. Yeah. And you have to pay that debt eventually. You know, so it's not based on morality. It's just based on how you conduct yourself as an individual. Like, you know what I mean? There's no uh, commandments. There's no, like, specific way... That you're supposed to conduct yourself. Obviously, all being humans, we understand that killing someone is no good. We don't need a commandment for that. Stealing someone's possessions, we know that's not good. We don't need a commandment for that. These are just natural tendencies that we have. As Mencius would say, you know, the great 
Confucian slash Taoist sage would say, you don't need any of that because how do you feel when someone steals your stuff? No you, don't, you don't feel good. So we don't need a law for that. Mm. We already have an understanding that that's not good. Yeah, that's kind of more intrinsic natural law. Natural law, kind of, yeah. You yeah. don't have to be told. You don't have to be told. To know. That it's, you it's almost a law of the land. Like if you see two dogs and one finishes its meal and it starts to walk over and starts eating the other dog's meal, then that dog gets angry as hell. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's the same, right? Yeah. The dogs don't need the, the, the laws. Mm-hmm. The regula- they know the law of the land. Here, the law of consciousness, the way that we understand the world. You know, we, we have those intrinsic qualities about ourselves, em, you know, empathy, humility, compassion, forgiveness. But then we give ourselves, you know, commandments as if that's going to be a way to cultivate a moral society. And it usually creates the opposite. Yes. So we are embodying Eastern spirituality through Western filters, you see. So... The new age is an embodiment of Eastern spirituality through Western filters. So we are conditioned with this Christian temperament of being super pious, super moral, um, based on a reality that there's a a Lord above us, judging us, so forth and so on. And then that's how we embody and understand Eastern spirituality. Incorrect. Mm. This is why... I always say, and a lot of people don't agree with this, but you and I know that this is fundamentally true and most other people who live in the East, who are Westerners, know this, is you need to go and spend time in those cultures and embody yourself in those cultures and live as they live. And you'll see and understand deeply why these philosophies came from there, why they have this mentality, and you'll also be affected by it. You and I have been affected deeply by living in Asia for a long time. And... You know, obviously studying the philosophies, you know. And so that's, I, I always, you know, implore people, if you really want to dive deep into this, you need to go and spend some time over there. I mean, sure, you can, you can understand a lot through reading books and listening to this podcast, but it's nothing compared to the real experience. Yes. Um, yeah, a lot of people kind of mis- misunderstand the studying um, Eastern spirituality that people think that they can um, get it fully from reading lots of books from a library mm. and, um, I don't know, weekly uh, meditation meetings with people and whatnot. Mm. That definitely has a good um, benefit. Yeah, of course. But, but um, it, nothing better than being in the actual origin of the place mm. and fully get absorbed into the environment and interact with the people very intimately mm. uh, is the way to go, really. Again, um, thinking of environment, that itself is a holistic way of thinking. Yes. yes. So uh, the, being in the right environment to learn something that you really um, desire to know mm. It's very important. Again, like we were saying yesterday, um, since we uh, found some good conversation of Jiru Krishnamurti, we have visited uh, several times his um, center in Varanasi. Old house. Old house. This is old house. Yeah. I mean, again, it's not the, uh, nothing um, fancy. It's no. just a, like a two-story... Two-story house. Two-story yeah. small house yeah. and white uh, painted cement building. Beautiful place. Yes. And we've been there and uh, the, some uh, ladies of, uh, at that place uh, showed us around that this is the room where uh, G, uh, Jidu was sitting and meditating, spending time and reading books. And mm. again, um, he passed on a long time ago, but we could feel his presence and uh, so much respect the people have mm, mm. for him in the area and he built the school around it, the boarding school yeah, yeah, yeah. for um, young people to study and whatnot mm. and be, again being in the environment that was much more different than just reading books and watching um, YouTube videos yeah, really yeah. again same thing with the Oroville mm, we actually mm, mm. visited Oroville and saw the place and where Mother and Sri Aurobindo uh, were, 
and we also visited uh, his ashram as well in yes, Pondicherry. And the very, I mean, every single moment in that uh, right environment is, again, I sometimes feel that much more powerful than reading whole Mahabharata. Yeah, of course, say. of course, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's uh, right in front of you and you are in it and it's very completely different energy. Yes. Yeah. In some sense, it's probably better for people to be ab- engrossed in those areas and absorbed in that environment. And then if you want to read the Mahabharata, that may come later. Mm-hmm. And then you'll have a good understanding of it because you've already settled your mind. You've already like fully embraced that environment. You know what I mean? So, you know, you and I talking about this, we, we know these places intimately because we've been there many times, but people listening probably had never had the opportunity to go, you know? And so it's, it, it can be hard to relate if you haven't been. Um, but if you have, it, it has such a powerful effect. You know, it's like, for example, you, you can look at the pictures of the pyramids and, yeah, this is right. But it's not like actually being at the pyramids. You know what I mean? Like going and being there and, and seeing the culture that, that those things are built in. Yes. You know what I mean? Understanding the place deeply, which yes. you take away with you for life, as mm-hmm. opposed to looking at the photos. And the photos in this context would be reading a book. So you read the book, you might read a book on Advaita Vedanta and you go, Wow, it's great. You know, I learned a lot. But you know how you'll learn a lot more is if you go to India and mm. you go to somewhere like Tiruvannamalai and go to the Ramana Ashram mm. every day and and it really embrace that environment and be absorbed in it and be on that level with the local people, you know. I think what completes the learning of something yeah. is the combination of uh, uh, intellectual understanding and experiential understanding, yeah, which yeah. is, again, hot cognitive function yeah. and the cold cognitive mm-hmm. function. Of course, you need to know intellectually what the place is about and um, w- w- what kind of people existed there and what kind of study came from them and mm-hmm. this kind of uh, intellectual understanding. But then once you have a bit of like a framework... Mm-hmm. Um, you have to have a experience uh, of that knowledge or whatever that you you're trying to learn, mm. because like what we remember of the, for example, place like Ar- Arunachala mm. where um, Ramana mm. was living, is that uh, we like, fly to Chennai, mm. which is closest biggest city. Mm. And get a taxi and then the three, four hour journey and get there and all like, so it's a complete experience to seeking that knowledge, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And we, we, we get there, we find accommodation to stay and um, uh, we, over time we become friends with the manager of the accommodation <laughs> place and yeah. we, again we become friends with um, chai wallas on the street yeah, and yeah, yeah. fruit ladies and... Oh, yeah. Um, like a supermarket people and Rudraksha Mala yeah everything (laughs) everything Mm. and so you have a whole landscape around that knowledge that you what you're trying to learn Mm. so that uh, that kind of completes your learning process so you cannot uh, eliminate no it it facilitates mm. deeper growth Mm. you know it's like you can meditate at home, right? You can meditate at home every day, and I'd say that's great. And you can understand this. Uh, you can have a good understanding, but not, nothing like going to a monastery, right? Going to a monastery, being a, em, embracing that environment, meditating every day longer than what you normally would meditate, and stay there for long periods of time and see what individual walks out of there, or if an individual walks out of there, mm-hmm. see who leaves, you know? A lot of people, and this is part of also new age thinking, right? <clears throat> a lot of people will read books, especially on Eastern spirituality, and then they get into like games of spiritual one-upsmanship where they'll say, oh, but Guyang and Jason, who is the one that wants to um, go to these places? Or I don't need to go to these places because I'm already, I'm already that. And it's like, okay, 
<laughs> First of all, you're making a statement that you're that means you're not that. Because you don't need to make that statement. Because there's no why. If you have reached really, re had really attained that level mm -hmm. of understanding. And even if you had attained that level of understanding, your mind is completely free. So mm -hmm. if someone had said that to you, you'd be like, yeah, it'd be great. Maybe it'd be good because you're very human. That's overanalyzing. Overanalyzing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. See, you're overanalyzing. You're playing a game of spiritual one upsmanship, which is a Western mentality. You're not feeling the energy of the conversation of what's actually being conveyed to you. You're seeing it away from what you're looking at. Oh, I've got an opportunity to be smarter than Guy Young now. So what I'll say, I can prove I'm more enlightened by saying, you know what, I don't need to go to Tiruvannamalai. You do, but I don't, see? I already have that understanding. Okay, you have it then. Yeah. <laughs> see, it's, it's arrogant, right? Mm. And this is the new age. Mm. And as you know, with my work, I've dealt with spiritual one-upsmanship from people for a, a decade mm -hmm. where people feeling inadequate for whatever reason, because I have a lot of knowledge about this stuff, they feel inadequate, so they have to put themselves up on a pedestal. Oh, why don't you just teach this or do this? And it's like, that's what you want. Mm. That's not what I do. Mm. You're confusing the reality here. You know, I, My role is to teach Eastern philosophy. Your role is whatever you're ta saying to me, mm. but you're trying to superimpose that onto myself. And you're saying it to try and get above who I am, as if there is above, or as if, and Again, that way of thinking, isn't it? It's that up and top down, down thinking. Mm. It's top down thinking. See, mm. Eastern spirituality is not about top down thinking. There's no top. There's no down. Mm. There's just everywhere. Mm. <laughs> there's, there's everywhere, and you are that everywhere. There is no such categories. No. Mm. You know, it's like, uh, so for example, our relationship with Zen monasteries and understanding of Zen and everything. When we see a master, a Zen master, after a retreat, like a session, like a session retreat, like for seven days, in the afternoon he might be having a beer. He's just having a beer. Do you know what I mean? And then what do Westerners do? Oh, oh, look, 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 look. Yeah, it's just kind of automatically judging. Or automatically judging. What's good and, and bad. And why are they judging that act? Think about it. He's just having a beer. Why are you judging it? Or is it very moralistic? It's moralistic, mm. see? It's based on sin. It's based on top-down mentality. What he's doing, oh, look, look, he's having a beer. He's supposed to be a master. It's one beer. Don't, you know, don't drop your lollies. It's, I mean, he's not getting battered like you get battered every <laughs> Friday night. He's just having one beer. He's just mm. chilling, you know? Let him be human. Yes. The idea of Zen and Taoism especially is to be fundamentally and radically human. You're not trying to eliminate your humanity. You're trying to enhance that. Yeah. That's why we've been with masters and um, they'll say, you know, you want, a, you want a beer? It's just a friendly gesture. Mm. You know, it's a friend. Mm. They, they are human too. Mm. And they want you to also see them as that. Mm. Yeah, they don't want to separate themselves from other no. people or the, or the rest of the society. Some of them really get cranky when people put them up on a pedestal. Like Westerners especially put the master up on a pedestal. Oh, he's such an enlightened being. The master sometimes gets cranky because he, he knows he's no better than them. He's just practiced a lot more. His mind is way more tranquil. But he knows that he has the same afflictions as anyone else. The human condition is the same in each and every one of us. But he's not, um, he's not avoiding his fear and his pain and, and anguish. He's looking into that. He's explored that and he's becoming free of that. That's all that separates them. It's a, it's a state of awareness that separates. That's all. It's not that he's better or worse. Yeah. And we have this top-down mentality. Always oh, drinking the beer, look at that. <laughs> Pretending to be holy. It's like, what? Mm. Like, that's Christian thinking. Mm. That's moralistic thinking. It doesn't equate to Eastern spirituality. You're thinking in judgment. And one of the best lines from the Tao Te Ching, which encapsulates what we're saying, 
which is fundamentally different to the Abrahamic religions, is the Tao loves and nourishes all, but does not lord it over them. That they make a point of this, does not lord it over them, loves and nourishes all. Is the most the humble yes. place that yeah does doesn't judge things. Doesn't judge. Right or wrong. There's no right or wrong. Yes. Right or wrong according to who? Yes. You know what I mean? Like this is the the, the discussion that we need to be having in the West. We have these debates about yep. moralistic perspectives, mm. but they're all based on everyone's different separate agenda, no matter whether it's a political ideal, religious ideal. As you know, Eastern spirituality is to throw all ideals out the window, yeah. and it's not an idealistic philosophy. Mm. They are realistic philosophies. Yes. They are not idealistic. They are promoting this um, extreme ordinariness. Yes. Extraordinary. Yeah. Hence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like like what Lin Chi said, mm. the great Zen master. Yeah. You know, take a crap. Mm. You know, move your bowels, eat your food, mm. have a good sleep. If you're tired, lie down. Yeah, tired, lie down. If you're down. hungry, you have eat. some food. Yeah. Don't analyze. Yes. Just follow nature. Mm. Oh, I'm hungry. Eat. You know, this is the teaching of Zen, right? If you said to the master, I'm hungry, he said, go and eat. Mm. That's it. Yeah. And a proper Zen monastery, not a super monastic Zen monastery I'm talking mm. about. Mm. So, you know, that's one of the, the crux, especially of New Age thought, and like, where we have that top-down philosophy. We don't understand that the energy of the universe or the, the verb, the Tao, which is moving through all of us as the same thing, doesn't care about your human morality, your intellectual perspective of morality. That's something you've cooked up yeah. in the basement, not something that the Tao has. The Tao is the way of nature, yes. and you are nature. You're supposed to follow the way of nature, and guess what? Morality isn't part of the way of nature. Mm. We have an intrinsic morality that doesn't need to be defined by rules and regulations. We know that it feels better to treat each other good and not harm each other. We know that we should not kill each other and, and you know, all of these things. Mm. We know that. Mm. And then people will say, but what about when someone does this? It still happens when there's rules and regulations. You can't help some people who have psychological problems. See that, like, if uh, more you want to um, have rules and regulations to control things... Uh, things become much more complex. Exactly. And in the end, we confuse ourselves. Yes. Because there are too many rules and regulations to follow, dissect every little thing in a like a smallest measurement. Mm. Uh, and that level of uh, controlling things, I don't think that's benefiting no. us at all. It causes more pain. It yeah. causes more psychological problems. Yeah. This is what Lao Tzu was talking about. This is why Lao Tzu and Confucius were diametrically opposed because Confucius was of the belief that all of these moral tenets that we apply to ourselves, all of these things that we follow in Confucianism produce a superior person or a superior man specifically, whereas Lao Tzu is saying that actually causes psychological harm and actually... Um, causes uh, psychopathy within us and you know this is best example through ox mountain with um mentors when mentors said you know to his thing like um you know his teachers uh his students said to to him um you say our nature is fundamentally good but look at ox mountain ox mountain is bare um, and look at all the other mountains around it they're all green they're all lush and then mentors said but you're not looking at it right and you, you don't have a good perspective because when you look at Ox Mountain, it's close to the city. And then um, people, people uh, come, use, come to it and, and, their, and their animals um, eat the, the crops and everything. And so all the new vegetation gets get ate and it, 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 it's highly affected by the environment it's in. And that's an analogy for how we are. So when we are in an environment that's, toxic in nature then we become what the environment is you know as a classic analogy you know what's that what's that uh, phrase by Jiddu Krishnamurti um, there's no measure of health to be fundamentally 
um, like embrace a uh, f- profoundly sick society, mm-hmm. something along those lines. Mm-hmm. So there's, mm-hmm. you know, basically like you're gone if you're if you are, you know, part of and influenced by a fundamentally sick society. So, and that's kind of like what Manchester was alluding to, and that's what we're not considering. We always consider that the individual is the problem, but usually it's the society and the environment that causes uh, psychopaths yeah. and, and people who are, who are psychologically sick. And, you know, we see this with suicide rates, depression and, and everything now. And, it, and obviously, because the way, especially Western civilization is, we're not looking at the society we're just blaming the individual that's right we're blaming oh he's just another mm. and then that's the conclusion it's like but shouldn't we look at the society that's happening this is happening in the east too as you know like you know with with teen suicide rates in korea yes. and in china and places like that where people aren't considering that maybe the education is a bit skew with and mm. you know maybe mm. this is not the way we're treating children is not right mm. And we know it's not because you don't, it's not natural for a 10 year old to jump out of the window of a building. We never had suicidal thoughts when we were 10. What's changed in 30 years? So, you know, and so the point is, is that we need to examine the societies we're in. And, um, and that's actually how you come to a conclusion of sometimes, not all times, but most cases I feel that, how an individual conducts themselves in the world, you know. That that's what Manchester's perspective was was about that. Yeah, uh, in the same way, we can solve the problem, like meaning uh, we can start from the individual level. Mm, of course, yeah. Um, whatever problem that happened in the world, the people blame individual, mm. but in the same way that. If individual is problem, from understanding the environment is very crucial for everyone. Mm. Each in, in, each individuals can change that environment yes. from being aware mm. of the problem mm. and uh, inner problem and out of problem. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, the individual is a society, and the society is individual. It goes vice yeah. versa, right? Mm. So, but the the birth of that is the individual is a society, and so. If you are working on yourself on an individual level, that benefits everyone else because you have a deeper understanding that you are the society. And this is why a lot of collectivist Asian cultures have had more success with certain things that need to get achieved on a collective level Mm. as opposed to the West when things are often individualistically oriented. So... And again, like especially if we look at it from an Indian perspective, the more, if we look at it from Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism, the more you're thinning out that sense of I, the more you're becoming more beneficial to the world. Instead of enhancing the I, and then, you know, that has an, that has an opposite effect. You know? Yeah. So mm. that's one of the, the core elements of that. Yeah, it's completely opposite, isn't it? Like instead of a trying to like a stand out yes. amongst the crowd yes. to just uh, getting rid of that sense of persona, ego. Yes. Then only you can contribute yes. to the rest of the people. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's why we yeah. have this Hollywood mentality in the West. Yeah. We want fame, we want fortune, we want to be well-respected. We are so frightened of being ordinary and nobody. And as you know, at Eastern spirituality, you are supposed to aspire to be not just nobody, but there's not even anyone there. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no one. You're living, but you're just like a limb of Shiva. That's it. You're just doing Shiva's work. You're doing the Tao. What are you doing today? I'm doing Brahman. That's it. But aren't you a person? No more. There's just no more there. Yeah, that's for public use. That's for public use. And it'll die when it when time comes this is a localization of consciousness but i'm not identified with the equipment anymore i understand that this is just a localization of the one consciousness and this equipment 
as we mentioned with the burning gut, is going to get burnt one day or get buried or whatever. It's going to, going to become food for worms. But I have I've ceased the identification with this because that doesn't benefit the world. And the world is who I am. Mm. I'm not an individual. The world is who I am. Yeah, that awareness is so important. Yes. That we need to be aware of that now. Of, of Instead of yeah. when you get closer to your death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But that's a common tendency, right? People yeah. turn to scriptures and they turn to meditation that when they, they're halfway out the door and it's like, no, no, no. The works should have begun you know, in earlier. Yeah. You know, we all have our own time. ASAP. ASAP, yeah. If you're hearing this podcast, get, get engaged now. Yeah. But, yeah, so like, again, like, if you're identifying with the individual, you don't contribute in some sense to the world. You may inspire other people for sure. But it's a um, it, 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 tendency to, to, to go south fast, especially when certain things in your life don't go as, as you plan. You know, if you follow that path, then naturally um, there's going to be ups and downs, you know. But if you're fundamentally just trying to become nobody to benefit the world, then you you have a deeper understanding of, or a deeper perception and worldview of what the world actually is. You're a part of that world. You're not separate from it. You never have been separate from it. Individualistic psychology, the cold cognition, fools us into believing that we are separate from the environment. You know. Yeah. So there's you. There's the environment. Again, it comes back to categories objects fundamental way of individualistic western thinking mm. which brings me to one thing i want to talk about before we, we wrap this up which is the you know about this but the examples that richard nisbet was talking about in the laboratories when they would analyze easterners and westerners asians and and and, and westerners about the um the what they see, do they see the foreground in images or the background? So that's what, you know, that's one of the ways that they have, have been testing both Easterners and Westerners. So that way that they tested was like they would, they would put a picture up, right? Like they would get Westerners in a room and then there would be like a, a big fish, like a bog fish, which stands out, right? And then there's like all of this ar Something. around it, all of these tiny little fishes and you know, the water and the reef and like, you know, like this background, right? And so when they would get the Westerners in, the uh, people who were testing, Richard and so forth and so on, would say, what do you guys see first? And so it was almost universal, like 90% of the group would say, we see, you know, obviously we see the bog fish, you know, we see the fish. It's a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah. See, no, nothing to say about it, right? So then... Then they get the, the Asian people in and they say, okay, so they show the same picture. What do you guys see first? What do you notice first? And then they say the background. Hmm. We notice the, the fish and, you know, the... So what does this allude to? This alludes to, again, categories and objects for Westerners and also relationships and context for Easterners. So they, are, and this goes back to even the language that we were talking about before, they see the background first. They see how the back, the, they actually understand the background first because then it can relate to the foreground. Mm. You see, where Westerners, because of just individualistic thinking and, and getting to the point and seeing what is so-called important is they see just what's in the foreground, but they, they, don't, pay, they don't pay attention to the background. They see just the foreground. And these tests were done for long periods of time and it was pretty universal. And as you know from 2015 when I did lectures in the UK and the US, that that was also universal amongst the groups too when, when I would ask them what they see. And there's also another image that they use where they have they have three pictures of they have they have the they, they have a chicken, a cow, and grass. And then they <coughs> the the test, and I did this too, as you know is 
okay, we have to pair these together. Which go together? And so when they did that, the Westerners, what do they do? They put the chicken and the cow together. And you know why they do that? Animals. Animals. Mm. Category. Category. And what do the West, what do the Easterners do? Grass. Cow right. eats grass. Cow eats grass. Yeah. Context, right? Mm. Relationship. It's fascinating, right? That that cognition is so intrinsic. And then we have people like Francis Fukuyama who believe that we all think the same. Mm. But that's not the case. It's not the truth. Yes. The, the thinking is fundamentally different. And this is why people like Georg Furstin, for example, would talk about cognitive styles. So we have to look about cognitive styles. You know, so the Asian people have a certain cognitive style, and actually, to a certain degree, Ch- Chinese and Indian people have a little bit different mm-hmm. cognitive styles. Mm-hmm. It's not universally the same, mm-hmm. but the the that Asian area has a, a, a particular cognitive style that is different to the, to West, the West. You know, mm-hmm. and it comes down to what we're talking about. This this kind of in the West we have this foreground thinking, so we think about. You know, I, I always use an athlete as an analogy where we, we're all not professional athletes and then we look at a professional athlete's life and, and he may have done something wrong off the field or something like that or maybe feeling the pressure of, of, you know, sport in general. And from a Western perspective, we see the foreground and we say, ha, he's a joker, this kid. Like, he, he does that, has no idea. He's, he's up to no good. But we're only looking at what the media show and just just that foreground perspective where if you look at it from an asian perspective you don't you're not so you're not so judgmental because you think first of all you think i'm not a professional athlete so who am i to judge Mm -hmm. i don't know the pressures of that professional landscape as an athlete with the media attention i mean it's a completely different world right so then you take into consideration then um Maybe there's things in his ordinary life that may be off, and you know you can't you can't take it just as the foreground. You gotta you gotta you gotta look at the whole landscape. Yeah, again, from that perspective, uh, Western perspective, you judge that um, sportsman as just an individual, as a professional um, athlete. Yes. Without having to understand that uh, that. Professional athlete is also a human. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. Like he's not superhuman. Exactly. I mean, uh, might be really physically uh, much much better at something than other people. Of course. But that doesn't uh, completely separate from rest of the humanity at no. all. No. Like, yeah. And that's a lack of understanding, right? Like you're looking at the athlete, like you look at a sage, like oh, the Zen master I talked about drinking a beer. Oh, he shouldn't be doing that. But he's a human. Humans make mistakes. That's why we have forgiveness and compassion for others, because we're all fundamentally human. Yeah. And we have this tendency to anthropomorphize people, like turn them into, like, you know. Yeah, beyond being a beyond the human. Yeah, beyond human, like almost like gods. Yeah. You know, like, and that's not the case. You know what I mean? They're, they're fundamentally radically human. And I don't actually believe that, like, all the absolute pious existence is is existing. I don't think... No, no it's, not, it's not a real thing. It's I a, don't think a, it's... It's just a, nice to think about. It's an idealistic yeah. thing to think about. And some people really strive to become that um, mm-hmm. being. But I don't believe that because... It, I don't people a lot of people might think that's perfect but mm. there is not that kind of perfection no, and no that, mm, it doesn't exist it's not real and we uh, maybe try to be that but um, I don't think that exists in the natural world well that's what it means to think of Zen right mm. so because like if you're trying to be too pious and too moral mm. It has a stench about it. Mm. We all have a gut instinct, right? And when the gut is usually saying, oh, I don't know about this one, like it seems like they're, they're too idealistic, they're too moralistic. And this is why Nietzsche, for example, was like he would mention that morality is like a sickness in some sense when people are too moral and 
and they because it is a little bit of a sickness a little bit of a psychopathy when you think about it because you're you're trying to be someone you're not and you're trying to influence others with that same sense of morality which is only based on your own perspective of how it should be moral your own perspective of right and wrong and good and bad which is kind of a sickness right because that's not how reality is like and that's why like in zen they say forget about all of that and just be radically human so once you start to embrace your humanity and you're not at odds with your humanity then you're a human you can be human and then maybe moral imperatives naturally arise but the problem with moralists and people who are too pious is they're at odds with their own humanity they don't realize that they they shit fart you know they have sex they do all these things that are very human they try to make themselves superhuman and above other people it's almost a sense of insecurity it is a sense of insecurity it's not almost it is a sense of insecurity because you're trying to put yourself above other people and you are in a sense not comfortable and secure with who you are naturally so you're trying to you know manufacture this artificial person you are and people do this in spirituality now they try to manufacture this spiritual person and they forget spirituality is very human that's literally showing that uh, high how it can become a psychopathy yes 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. and that's what happens and that's why you see a lot of people who are super moral and super pious some of them they go nutty you know because first of all people don't resonate with that sense of idealism there's something in our gut that's that says there's something wrong with that because it's not natural right it's not realistic it's not realistic and it's not natural realistic here being natural right so it's it's not natural we we feel it and we go there's something wrong here like this person shouldn't be telling people to do this and to do that we should be skeptical of that individual mm. rightly so you know they've disconnected from the environment they've disconnected from the society they've disconnected from their own humanity you know that's why I don't know if you remember uh, bad example using Osho as an example <laughs> but Osho once said you know um, Jesus was too good mm. you know you don't ever want to be someone like that like it was too pious too perfect too perfect you know what I mean and that's not to you know diminish if Jesus Christ was an, in, was an actual real person we don't know you know what I mean but the what Osho is talking about is that that sense of piety and that sense of like goodness, fake goodness, social morality is is really has a stench about it. To stink of Zen, yeah, I think he actually said that Jesus is insanely good or something. Insanely like that. Insanely good, something like that, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, from Eastern spirituality, and from what we're talking about today, is when you have that holistic cognition. You understand that the fears and the anxiety and all of these things that we have about ourselves, the love and everything, we all share that collectively. It's not something isolated to yourself. And this is what leads to actually more psychopathy because people get condemned for thinking differently or for behaving differently. Some people express it. We express things differently. Some people express their fear differently. Other people will suppress their fear. Do you know what I mean? Like we, all, but we're all sharing the same feelings and the same emotions. We're just expressing it and behaving differently according to those emotions. And those that differences are just superficial. Superficial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People will see a crazy guy, on, crazy guy on the street, screaming and just out of his mind. Maybe he had a um, bad day. Yeah. No, no. But my point <laughs> is, he had a bad day, right? And he's expressing it that way. But you yourself may be the same, but you're expressing it in here. You may not be an extroverted person, so you're an introverted person, and you, you know, you suffer on the inside where he's like, oh, he's, he's letting it all out, letting it all hang out, you know, mm. which you know can be problematic if certain things arise. But the point is, is that we all share the same feelings, the same fears, the same anxieties, and the same insecurities, and that comes with disconnecting ourselves from the environment, not living from the holistic perspective. And not understanding that we're part of something much greater than ourselves. And that's the core of Eastern spirituality, right? 
that's why in the East, they have like the kasana to, to feel like you're part of something much greater. That's just on a social level. You need to get to the level of you're part of something even greater than the society itself. You, we're all part of Brahman or the Tao, you know. And it's not judging or condemning us. We are an, just an aspect of it. We're an expression of that. And we can only align with that when we begin to dissolve the sense of individuality. To realize that the individual actually never existed. Which, you know, that's a that's at a high, high level. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I guess we tackled it all, yeah, didn't we? Uh, yeah, I'm very happy with the, our discussion. Yeah. Mm. The, there's so many things you can talk about with mm. this one, with, with uh, the differences in cognition. But it's a, it's, I think it's very important for people to understand because, as we mentioned at the start of the podcast, if we don't understand it, it's hard to understand why certain cultures behave certain ways, you know. And we think that there's one universal way of thinking, which is not true. It's, it's never yeah. been true. Yeah, we, we all have to get out of that sort of mindset that everyone thinks the same way as you do. No, yeah, That's exactly. a, actually a very, very big mistake. Yes. Yeah. That will cause uh, more of a conflict within yourself. Yes. That's not a proper understanding of... Um, other people in general yes well we have you know sorry to go on but we we've had problems in business before there's a classic example with um japan and australia where there was um a certain deal done with uh sugarcane sugarcane yes so japan went through i forget what situation it was but there was a tough situation they went through but they had a contract right they had a deal with australia for a certain amount of, um, you know, sugar cane. Sh- sugar, not sugar, you know, basically sugar. Yep. And Australia having, you know, large resources for sugar. And and the, uh, I forget the situation. Maybe it was an earthquake or something like that that happened in Japan. It was a while back. It was back in like the 90s or something like that. And um, Japan said, like, you know, kind of, in a sense, reneged on the, the contract, like kind of like said, you know, it's, we don't need that much anymore. And, and this, you know, like, because we're, we're, we're doing it a bit tough, you know. Mm. And Australia's like... Yeah, circumstances have changed. Circumstances have changed, mm. right? And <laughs> Australia obviously says, yeah, but you got a deal, bro. Like, Contract is contract. contract you is signed contract. it. Yeah, and so you see there's a cultural differences there. And that comes down to, again, self-interest, individualism versus holistic understanding. Mm. I don't want to say Australia was completely wrong. There, there is there is some truth to a contract is a contract, but at the same time, circumstances do change, as you said. And there's evidence, and you know, Nisbet, Nisbet talks about this in his book that there's actually evidence of this in Japan, where um, circumstances change, so they alter, you know, the situation. Mm. So it's very common. Mm. Yeah, just a, a mutual understanding and agreement to come to adjust the deal or whatever they're dealing with. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. These things are, I believe, necessary because we uh, we are here to work together. Yeah. You can't just force uh, just your way. No. Mm. Well, there was a situation in Japan. I may get this a little bit wrong, but there was an agreement with the the cinemas, with certain film distributors, and so forth and so on. And um, there was heavy uh, snow and blizzards and, and so forth and so on. So there was a reduction in ticket sales and people going to watch movies. And then the contract that the cinema had with the uh, film companies, the cinemas gave some of the money back mm. because they knew that you know there, there was no way to fulfill the expectations because... You, know, you haven't. Yeah, you, if there's this. blizzards, yeah. you're not going to be going to the cinema, are yeah. you? You might you might die on the way there. So, but that goes to show that there's an element of understanding that situations change and contracts are are contracts, but also there needs to be an asterisk mm. over a contract saying that you know if circumstances do change, you know, to an effect that it's it's hard to commit. To this contract, we need to reevaluate it or reassess it in a certain way. 
And that's again comes down to differences between Easterners and Westerners. And a lot of Westerners listening right now will probably disagree. Oh, contract is a contract. Okay, I don't agree with you. I'm not saying either or, but we just need to understand that there's differences in understanding here. Yep. You know. Some people may say, yeah, but the Japanese they also act in a self interest. You could you could see it that way. But you could also see that they were acting out of necessity. They couldn't fulfill that certain uh, requirement that they had on the original contract because the economy had taken a, taken a battery and they, they just couldn't afford it. Yes. You know. So that's again to reiterate what we've been talking about. But mm-hmm. anyway. So yeah, I enjoyed it today. Yeah. So for everyone listening, they should definitely read uh, the geography of thought, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a very meaty book, but at the same time, it's so enjoyable to read. Yeah. There's so many, um, like the, the uh, lab um, experiments. experiments yeah, yeah. yeah, there's stories even with the young children between Western children and Eastern children. There's so many different stories to um, showcase the differences. Mm. Uh, very in, in, enjoyable reading. Mm. Yeah, I remember you were reading on the kitchen floor in Chiang Mai for whatever reason. I don't know why you were reading on the kitchen floor. Yeah. <laughs> it was one day uh, that came yeah. to my mind. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was funny. Mm. A little hot apartment. I guess there's not much room in that apartment. But. Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely recommended. Yeah. And also, mm. I think my book, Enlightenment, now goes a lot into a little bit of it too, right? Oh, so. definitely. That much more uh, philosophical mm. way, but I think very fundamental. And to me, again, to, that's the kind of that's the favorite books amongst you, what you've written, yeah. because it really gets to the bottom of the philosophy of uh, the, the way we think, why we think differently. Yeah. Which affects our perspective of Definitely. Enli- enlightenment. Right? Again, that gives uh, so many answers to the uh, many questions. Yeah, yeah. But that's also another part of what we sort of what we've been talking about because Westerners think about enlightenment as a destination or a place yeah. to get to. Easterners think of it as an actual state of mind. It's interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. So I talk a lot about that in the book. So if you guys wanted to get that book, go out and grab that book too. Also, Nisbet's book, I recommend. And hope you guys enjoyed the podcast today and we'll see you guys next week.